my first video on Marx, and goddamn, you know what? <laughs> if one tenth of the time that people talked out of their ass about Marxism and instead read actual Marx, the world would be a very different place. Most people <laughs> don't understand Marxism. <laughs> it's free, okay? It's not difficult. It's not that goddamn difficult. Modern life comes with its comforts often touted and well known. We should be thankful we live better than kings used to. And so on. That's because capitalism is the most revolutionary order of things the world has ever seen. But the modern world demands a steep price that we are not free not to pay. It's alienating. Now, of course, capitalism did not invent alienation, but even in its nascent form, a young Marx perceived that it produces new forms of alienation that did not exist prior. Now, just in case you prefer to willfully misinterpret that, Marx is not saying the world was better before capitalism. In fact, he says the opposite. What's up, dude? <laughs> He's to my left. The bourgeoisie, during its rule of scarce 100 years, has created more massive and more colossal productive forces than have all preceding generations together. But there's also this thing we can do, even on YouTube, where you can say that benefit and harm might both be consequences of the same system. Now, we have a few Marxes here. Young Marx, in his writing style and his appeals, is rather idealist. Not idealist as in optimistic, but idealist in form, like the philosophers who inspired him, namely Hegel and Feuerbach. All right, let's do this. So from a Marxist critique, there's four emergent forms of alienation under capitalism that we can point to. First, there's alienation from yourself and how you see yourself. There's alienation from work and what you make. There's alienation from nature, seen here as a whole, and alienation from others other people. To be alienated means that there's a schism or rupture where there shouldn't or need not be one. So presumably, in a different world, we could have intimacy with all these things, but by virtue of its mechanism, capitalism f***s up all these relations, and with it comes a deep sense of having lost something important. Now there's one thing that people often get wrong when they talk about alienation, whether they're speaking favorably or unfavorably of Marxism. And that's to suggest that alienation is just a feeling you get from living and dying under capitalism. And alienation is felt, yes, but it's felt because of an objective, measurable relationship. Both the objective and the subjective are two distinct forms of the same conditions here. That is a material history. Now this general sense of loss is a common theme of many of my videos. We can call it disenchantment, we can call it the experience of a lack, or hereafter, alienation. Notably, the feeling of loss is not the same as actually having lost something, though that doesn't prevent us from acting as though we had. Alienation means something is missing in this way if we are born and die in capitalism, which is probably true. Now, I expect this medium has obliterated your attention span long ago, so here's a 30 second summary of alienation. Load it up with visual stimulation for those tired synaptic relays. So first, you're alienated from nature because it has no value other than as a dead resource from which to extract capital. Or maybe something to buy wrapped up in plastic. Marx's view of nature is broader than ours and includes both human nature of transforming and the natural world which is transformed. Commodification alienates us from the interdependent relationship with nature. Second, you're alienated from what you make because you don't have ownership over what's produced, probably. Whatever it is you make, whether it's burgers, deliveries, or advertising copy, someone else owns your day and your work is sold under someone else's logo. Now three, you're alienated from other people because most of them are seen as your competition for scarce resources, wages, or attention. Or they're your boss or employer 
whom you likely resent or fear to some degree because they have punitive power over your life. Regardless, you can't really trust anyone with whom you have a market relationship and are not inclined to see them as a community with which you can undertake major projects. And four, you're alienated from yourself because instead of seeing yourself as a creative, world-changing member of the human species, you're merely a profit machine among other machines, a replaceable appendage of a process in which you have no real agency or input. Okay, so it's not always so bad. You can have friends at work, you can have a good boss and rewarding projects, and maybe benefits that make work life tolerable. But most workers, 85%, according to Gallup, are unhappy at work. What's not at all surprising, or what wouldn't be surprising to Marx, is that the number one indicator of enjoying your work is the self-reported quality called meaningfulness. That's right, not pay, but the feeling that you are contributing to something valuable. I wanna stress this because Marx said in 1844 that this would be a big problem under capitalist employment. Now Marx has obviously been breathlessly criticized for just about everything that one could possibly be criticized for. And whether or not those are fair or not, I don't care, that's not my concern here. But what he was certainly not wrong about is the alienation that wage labor produces, an unhappiness. Even if you don't like what he suggests might happen as a result of that discontent, you know, violence. But it must be admitted that Marx was right about this. A lack of dignity in work, or in his terms, being alienated, leads to unhappiness. So what is so bad about capitalism that it could ruin your human dignity? It all comes down to basically one exchange. Workers, are making something. Cheeseburgers, shoes, Marvel movies, whatever. They, they do their one job here, and then they get paid hourly, salary, doesn't matter. It also doesn't matter how much you get paid, whether it's $7.50 an hour or $75 an hour. In each case, they get capital in exchange for work, but in each case, they produce more profit than they get paid. And here's the central tenet of Marxism. All the surplus goes here to those who are not doing any work. They're exploiting labor. Now, exploitation doesn't mean something like you're being harmed or someone's being mean to you. It only means that someone who is not working is skimming off the top of your labor, even after, you know, expenses and everything. Now, if you're getting paid 75 bucks an hour, you probably don't care much that you're getting exploited because you can afford a jet ski for the weekend. Jet skiing then makes you forget your alienation, but it doesn't give you ownership of your labor or make you want to work towards common goals with other people. This is something Marx wants to get back to. Now it's worth mentioning that it's not like the capitalist, the one who's profiting, is perfectly content here. They're also discontent for different reasons, mostly because they're disconnected from the majority of humanity. Now, Marx clearly has some loftier human goals in mind. Remember, he's heavily influenced by German idealism. But alienated wage labor leads to predatory and greedy human behavior, seeing others as rivals, and seeing yourself as an undignified instrument of labor, and not having the time to be concerned about environmental damage, for example. I'm gonna interrupt myself here, because I already have the graphic made. <laughs> Let me address the most common criticism of Marxism by people who don't understand it, and even by people who identify as Marxists just to piss off their parents. <laughs> Many suggest that Marxism is just about wanting the world to be more fair. Buckle up, bucko, the world's not fair. Now grow up. Wrong, 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 wrong. Marx doesn't want to fix or overthrow capitalism because it is unfair, though it is unfair. The world, though, has never been fair. And that's not the reason he gives that all this should change. And look, general rule, if you've heard that Marx is a dumbass, chances are it's a dumbass saying that, okay? What Marx points out is just, look, there are always going to be 99 of these people for every one of these people. So if these people have wills, minds, and bodies, why would they let the situation stay like it is? 
When 99 people want something, it seems impossible that this one person will be able to prevent them from changing it and maintaining a system that disproportionately benefits this one person, but all that potential energy is on the other side. This capitalist is, after all, just a single body. What we should expect, says Marx, is that these people will eventually demand change. In a democracy, for example, they could try to elect someone to bring about redistributive change. And if that doesn't work, they will begin to use their combined energy to bring an end to this contradiction in more forceful ways. Violence is not precluded, no, but it's also only necessary if the capitalists refuse to concede. Which, by the way, they have done quite often in the past due to pressures from organized labor movements and such. The problem, as it turns out, is getting these 99 to realize the contradiction and then do something about it. So back to alienation then, which is not about fairness either. It's merely about owning your own life, your own time, and realizing that 99 people working together for a common goal can do a lot more than 99 people trying to outcompete or cannibalize one another. That could never work. Pie in the sky, infantile pie, the sky, mother... Sure, maybe that would never work except all the times that it did. And maybe we are already in the best possible world with the best possible distribution of capital and ownership. Maybe these versions of alienation are the best we can hope for. But Marx thought differently. Now, I have said a lot of what I said Marx said. <laughs> so you got to get to the point real quick in a video like this because that's all that most people watch. So here's what Marx says Marx says. <laughs> Oops, wrong image. Sorry about that. <laughs> I have about half of this from young Marx in 1844 and half from older Marx in 1857. From the standpoint of capital and wage labor, the creation of, object of the objective product happens in antithesis to the immediate labor capacity. That this process of objectification in fact appears as a process of dispossession from the standpoint of labor. To that extent, this twisting and inversion is a real phenomenon, not merely a supposed one existing in the imagination of the workers and the capitalists. Grundrisse. All right, so here's, here's that hot theory. This alienation being a real phenomenon is not a feeling, or rather, it's not just a feeling. It's measurable. You're purposeless in work and purposeless in leisure. The first, because your work isn't yours. And the second is that because you only see yourself in terms of that work, leisure then is only for consuming from now on. You're expected not to ever change anything either at work or in leisure. Now this feeling has a source we can pinpoint. Now to believe this, which I will not assume you do, you have to accept the premise. That is that your body is yours. And I'm 100% sure you believe that. But by extension for Marx and for all liberal contract theorists as well, your labor is also yours. It's the energy of your body in the world. Now here's the thing that people get hung up on. Selling your labor, your effect on the world, doesn't just mean that it's no longer your effect. Just like if you're an artist, your painting is always yours. If someone buys your song, that song is still yours. And even if you sell your labor to a burger or a shoe company, it's still yours. It's just that you've been alienated from it. Maybe think of it this way instead. If, if you make a mark on the world, if you go out and carve your name into a tree. It's objectively true that that is your mark. That mark can't be transferred because it, it just is yours. Even if you sign a paper or a contract saying that someone else made the mark, it doesn't mean they did. And even though this video is online, it will always be my labor. Now, for whatever reason, when it comes to intellectual property, this makes sense to everyone for some reason. But when it comes to a burger or a shoe, we believe that that restaurant or shoe company owns the product by putting a logo on it. But no, there's human energy in that product forever. And that's why Marx says it's real and a non-alienating system of exchange would take this into account and would also be more human. So, for example, just think about what you're wearing right now. Not the brand, but the labor that is in it. 
probably the labor of an Indonesian, Thai, or Bangladeshi worker. F***ing real, right? Their labor is still recorded in these products. So we tend to see things in terms of their brand image. But for Marx, the whole purpose of the brand image is to obfuscate and hide the human labor invested in it. And if we saw our stuff as human labor, maybe we would start understanding the profound relations we have with others, even workers in a country far across the ocean. Man, since writing this video, I've been like thinking about this constantly, every, everything that I own. Now, Marx is hopeful that we can start seeing stuff as records of human activity and labor. Brands alienate that human vision. The emphasis shifts to the mark and not the cause of the mark, which is, in every case, exploited labor. Alienated labor is worse for everyone involved. First, it's worse for products. Because when you're getting a wage, the only incentive you have to do a good job is to not get fired. That's only a negative incentive, and it'll make you hate your job. But more significantly, Marx is a humanist and believes that humans are happier when they are rewarded for doing their best work. If you're making a burger for a date, I'm a wager to guess that you're gonna do your best. You'll hope it's good. You'll ask if it's good because you have ownership of that object as a representation of you. And if you're a chef and your reputation's on the line, the same thing. But conversely, if you're a line cook in the back of a hot kitchen, warming something up that you had no input in creating with someone else's logo on it, of course you won't do your best. Similarly, you won't make suggestions to improve it, and then your eight hours of work is completely wasted. The customer, too, is robbed of your creativity. Your day sucks, and you're just waiting for it all to be over. And the only person who benefits from this arrangement is the capitalist, that is, the brand and the shareholders. If only there were a better way. Who would dare to suggest such a thing? Two, your relationships are worse. This is alienation from others, again. Now, to relationships with nature and people, this is Marx at his most glassy-eyed. Who is naive enough to be hopeful? Instead of seeing people as your boss, whom you hate, customers, whom you hate, because they only see you as a burger machine, or as competitors waiting to take your job, you could see the whole of humanity as one organism, a species seeking a better life for the species. But again, as a wage earner, there's no incentive to do that because the scope of your life is your hourly wage and taking that home to just your family. If only there were a better way. <laughs> Who would dare to suggest such a thing? Three, self-image or alienation from self. Being a cog here, or seeing yourself as an appendage of the burger, shoe, or movie factories doesn't just affect your view of your boss and the customers, it also affects your view of yourself. Because for eight hours a day, you aren't a human, you're just an output machine, from which products are expected, and from which no human contact is really expected. And the only time you own your activity is in leisure. And what is leisure but consumption, instead of creation? As a result, therefore, man, the worker, only feels himself active in his animal functions, eating, drinking, procreating, or at most in his dwelling and dressing up, etc. And in his human functions, he feels himself to be nothing more than an animal. What is animal becomes human, and what is human becomes animal. Of course, with a wage, life is not a means to life. It's just a means to satisfy more needs. As long as that's their scope of action, there's no benefit to doing any more than that, to putting more effort in. And look, Marx might be optimistic here, but he just says, imagine that you saw all your time as yours. What would your day look like? Would you act like an animal all day, consuming, lazing around? Or would you look for projects to put your hands on? Would you seek out activities with others, more often or less often? Would you be stressed and anxious more or less? If only there were a better way, who would dare suggest such a thing? Now, I have extolled Marxism here, and of course I would love a world in which everyone understood alienation as a problem and sought to, you know, vote for policies to reduce it. 
But there is one last thing that's required for this whole humanist vision to work. And while it sounds very nice as a goal, it's a little bit hard to imagine at scale. And I like to think I have a pretty good imagination. So the question is this, if we are rid of alienation, everyone sees their labor as their own. But then who's gonna do the unpleasant labor? You know, cleaning toilets, making burgers, or risking your life while logging or ocean fishing. Now here's a proposed answer to that. Who in your house cleans toilets and does the unpleasant work? And why do they do it? It's not for profit, it's not for wage, probably. <laughs> it's love and volunteer work. Because, I mean, ideally, you are a respected member of your family and you want to make them happy. Now, don't be an idiot and say, oh, Marxism is stupid, even Pills said so. Look, there are still millions of things that could be done to make labor less alienating than this late capitalist hellscape. But that said, Marx suggests that in societies that are not alienated, the unpleasant jobs might be handled much like they are in a family, when time is not money and when everyone sees themselves as a member of the community, of the species. Then doing selfless labor would be a matter of respect and reward. Young Marx has a term for that. Man is a species being, not only because in practice and in theory he adopts the species, his own as well as those of other things, as his object, but also because he treats himself as the actual living species. And there is something to be said for this, of course. No one would want to clean toilets for 10 hours a day, which is what unskilled laborers are currently condemned to. However, it seems reasonable to get 10 people to each clean toilets for one hour a day if they were respected for it and could spend the rest of their day doing something more enjoyable with their time that they own. And here, unfortunately, is where my faith in humanity is attenuated. For this as a total end, anyway. All 10 of those people have to continually be good members of the species, and this is kind of a rosy vision. Totally worth striving for, but it's increasingly less likely to last the larger a group gets, because it pretty much just takes one person to f the whole thing up. And as soon as you have a disciplinary apparatus in place, then you are now reintroducing alienation with the threat of violence. But maybe we get robots to do it. Marxist utopia, boom. In any case, now, there's a lot more transformation of thought still required between alienation from others and a fully fledged sense of species being. And that is where this becomes something like a personal or communal goal. So here's the appeal. Instead of looking at Marxism as an entire form of government on all or nothing and hand waving it away, if some part of this is worth believing, that we can be less alienated, the utility of this belief is that even now you can see your consumption as the record of someone else's labor. You wear it, you sleep in it, it's in your pocket, and that someone else that member of the species, their labor was exploited by a capitalist, probably just like you are. Marx in the Grundrisse sees an eventuality that we will have to wake up from individualism in order to survive. With the positing of the activity of the individuals as immediately or general social activity, the objective moments of production are stripped of this form of alienation. They are thereby posited as property, the organic social body within which individuals reproduce themselves as individuals, but as social individuals. Now, I have a community which ensures that not all of my labor is alienated. Thank you. And I gotta express my gratitude that they have a sense of species being enough to pick the topic for this video and support its creation. If you appreciate my intellectual labor, you can visit Patreon for exclusive content several times a month. Most people don't understand Marxism. Like when you when you're saying this, like when you were so adamant about it, I had to start reading about it myself, mm -hmm. and I had to start doing a lot of research about it myself.